Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of God. Alleluia. The reading is written in the 15th chapter of Matthew. Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you say that you don't need to honor their parents, and so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Jesus replied, Every plant not planted by my heavenly Father will be uprooted, so ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind, and if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. Then Peter said to Jesus, Explain to us the parable that says people aren't defiled by what they eat. Don't you understand yet, Jesus asked. Anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of life. Alleluia. Please be seated. So today, uh, we are starting a brand new series. Uh, it's called, You're Not the Boss of Me. Uh, if I had to give it a subtitle, it would be, How to Say No to the Harmful Emotions that Compete for Control, all right? Because we do have emotions inside of us, and they always try to compete for control, and they always try to be the boss of us, okay? And so you may be thinking, well, <clears throat> Pastor Brad, why this series? I'm glad you asked. Uh, two reasons. One, I believe there's a natural tendency for us as human beings to gravitate towards autonomy. All right? How many of you like to be told what to do? Yeah, yeah. None of us like to be told what to do, right? We gravitate towards autonomy, all right? Because we don't like to be told what to do. Let's face it. Autonomy is the American dream, right? <clears throat> I mean, that's what we always say. It's what we want to do when we want to do it, with enough money to pay for it, and enough money to keep us out of, uh, out of jail when we get caught, <laughs> right? Uh, so this is an alluring goal. It's what's out there. It's what's, what's, what we teach people, right? And if you heard me say, we, you are right. You're like, hey, wait a minute, Pastor Brad, did you say we? So you're, you're a part of all this too? No, I'm well above that. Of course I'm a part of the we, all right? Of course I'm a part of that. 
Uh, for all of us, there's something inside of us that we want to be in a position, all right, where nobody tells us what to do, all right? There's just that natural gravitation. But when it comes to our emotions, we kind of take a different route. We allow those emotions a lot of times to tell us what to do and what to say. And, and, and we, we allow them to control us in certain ways. They're, they become the boss of us, right? And sometimes we get into trouble. We get into trouble because we take our own advice. <laughs> and our own advice, let me tell you, it's always filtered through emotions, okay? It's always filtered through emotions. And those emotions have the ability, more often than not, to distort reality for us, okay? So... That brings me to the second reason for this series. A lot of time, what we say is filtered through those emotions. Then we need to become aware. We need to become mindful of those emotions, okay? So that we can help deal with them when they surface, all right? We have to be mindful of that. I've been working and doing a lot of work over the past few years on mindfulness, right? Becoming aware of where I am in the present, becoming mindful of my emotions, right? Because here's the deal, emotions have a way of competing, all right? They have a way of competing for control in, in, in what drives our behavior, all right? And so we need to become mindful of those emotions because it can become the filter for our motivations to do things. One thing I've discovered in my work is that I am messy and that's okay, all right? And, and, and I think if we have a starting point for this series, I think that's it, all right? So I need all of you to say this, okay, so that we, you can know that it's okay. I need everybody to say, I'm messy and that's okay. <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm messy, uh, one more time. <clears throat> Some people even turn to their wives just to make sure, you know, uh, <laughs> so that we're all on the same page, right? It's okay, all right? It's okay, but here's the thing, all right? When working towards changing those things and becoming better into creating habits that are helpful for us and making change, lasting change in our lives, if you look at the pyramid of that, if you look at the pyramid of how we change, you know what the bottom part always is? Awareness. You have to become aware because you can't change something if you're not aware of it, right? Awareness always, change always begins with awareness. Improvement always begins with awareness because you have to be aware of that thing that you want to get better at. You have to be aware of that thing that you want to change in order to be better at it, all right? A Buddhist spiritual leader once said, you know what, you're perfect where you are and you need improvement, <laughs> right? I believe this speaks perfectly to our Lutheran uh, slogan, we're saints and sinners both at the same time, right? So we all, if we're all aware that we're messy, we're all aware that, yeah, we're perfect where we're at, but we do need some improvement. We've got these emotions inside of us. We need to become mindful of them. All right? <clears throat> Let me pause real quick and let's talk a little bit about mindfulness. All right? What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is paying attention in a different way. Okay? All right? You, you do mindfulness on purpose because you're trying to change something. All right? All right? You do mindfulness on purpose because you want to be present in the moment. Being mindful means that you're present right here, right now, that you are in that moment, okay? And when you come to it, you come to that place non-judgmentally. That's why I had you said that you're messy and that's okay, all right? You come to that place not judging yourself, all right, for, for, for what you want to change, okay? So it's purposeful, it's in the present moment, all right? And you come to it non-judgmentally. All right? It's a way to take charge of the direction and the quality in our own lives. All right? Now, the more mindful you are, aware of these harmful emotions, the less you may find yourselves creating harm, not only to yourself, but to the people who are around you and, and to the rest of the world. All right? And in the text that we just heard Jan read, we actually see Jesus inviting the religious leaders, inviting the disciples, and inviting us into a place of mindfulness. 
He would probably call it monitoring. I call it mindfulness, right? Now, most of us are mindful about our behavior, all right? We, we can see it because we can see it. I don't think a lot of us are very mindful about our emotions because they're inside of us, right? We can't see them, all right? They're hard to see. But Jesus invites us to come into a process of monitoring or to be mindful to a whole new level, to look past simply just monitoring how we behave and actually being mindful about what starts in here, okay? So let's go back to the text for a moment. <clears throat> in our text for today, Jesus is confronted by some Pharisees and, lead and teachers of the religious law, all right? They come to him. And in the text, if you notice, it says, they came from Jerusalem to meet Jesus, all right? That's your cue to say, hey, they're up to something, all right? They just don't come to Jesus to have a casual conversation with him, all right? They weren't interested in that, all right? They were interested in tricking and entrapping Jesus, all right, to say something that he would later regret, all right? By the way, this is one of my most favorite exchanges between Jesus and, and the Pharisees, right? I, I, I told the skates as it was coming out, I was like, you got to admire the chutzpah of Jesus, right? <laughs> it's just like, hey, let's talk about this, shall we? You know, he gets right to it, right? He gets right to it. And so they come to him and they ask him a question. He, he, they say, so why is it that your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Because they don't wash their hands before they eat. All right, so let's just time out right there. Some of you may be looking at that, 21st century eyes, and going, well, what's wrong with that? Right? Yeah, they should probably wash their hands before they eat, you know? But remember, this is first century. One, there's a motivation behind it, okay? Number two, remember, there's very little water around. You just don't have water everywhere you go. You don't have hand sanitizer stations everywhere, okay? And water was precious. You just didn't go pouring water over everything all the time, right? You had to conserve it. You had to, you had to mind, mind it. Why? Because if you ran out, what would happen? You have to walk in order to get your water again, right? So you had to be very conservative with it, all right? <clears throat> but this was a big deal for the Pharisees and, and the teachers of religious law. Now, they said, why don't you, your disciples, keep the tradition of the elders, all right? This was known as the oral Torah. You had two different types of Torah. You had the written Torah and you had the oral Torah, all right? The written Torah, basically the law, okay? The written Torah is what we have. All right, it's the Older Testament, the books of Moses, has all the laws in it, 613, we've talked about that before, right, 613 laws outside of the Ten Commandments. They were written down, everybody knew them. Then you had this thing called the tradition of the elders, which was the oral Torah. This is some sort of mysterious teaching that supposedly came down with Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments and had 103 other commandments with him that only a certain group of people knew. Why? Because it was forbidden to write them down. All right? So only the religious leaders, only the pastors knew these laws. Okay? Only the teachers of the religious law knew them. All right? Because you couldn't write them down. Only a few people knew about them. And here's the thing about it. They would always bring them out and apply them when it was convenient. All right? Because let's face it, nobody knew them, right? It's kind of hard to do something that you don't know what it is you're not supposed to do, right? And sometimes, if you notice, if you notice in Jesus' response, sometimes it was in direct conflict with the written Torah, okay? They didn't, they didn't compute. So Jesus is not buying this. Jesus didn't believe in this secondary, mysterious, only a handful of religious leaders know exactly what is written in this Torah business, right? He didn't buy it. Now, 
part of this oral, to uh, oral Torah, this tradition of the elders, was this rule to keep yourself ceremoniously clean as a Jew. All right? In other words, you didn't want to defile yourself. Whenever you see defile, I want you to think of this, being at odds with God. All right? That's really what defilement meant. All right? It wasn't just about being dirty or being, you know, not clean. It was really about putting yourself at odds with God. That's what defilement was. Okay? And so there was this ceremonial washing you had to go through to make sure that you didn't accidentally violate any dietary laws. And so you had to go through this certain washing every time before you ate. Now, I'm not talking about 20 seconds under, uh, underwater with soap, you know, as you say the Lord's Prayer. I'm talking about you better add this into your calendar because it's going to take a while, okay? <laughs> it's not as easy as we think. And so Jesus is not buying this, all right, when they're talking to it. So they come up to him, they ask him about this, and he says, oh, really? Well, let's talk about law for a moment. Why is it that you don't actually follow the written command from God for the sake of your own tradition? In other words, why do you pass up that that is written down over your oral tradition that nobody knows about except for you? You guys use these traditions, you bring them out to manipulate people because they don't know it. And every time they do something you don't want them to do, you suddenly bust out and go, oh, well, the tradition of the elder says. Nobody knows these laws. You don't even write them down. So how are they supposed to follow them? And now I don't need to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this anyway. Religious leaders and religious systems have the tendency of still doing this. And we've done it in our past, Right? These unwritten rules that all of a sudden come out when it's convenient. When it's convenient to keep people away from the table and out of our pews that we don't want in our pews and at our table. When it's not our table and our pews to begin with. Right? We do this all the time. Creating rules to the game in order to win and to manipulate people in a certain way. And guys, this just isn't religious systems. This is all systems. Our leaders do this to us all the time. All of a sudden, there's this unwritten rule that, bust, that they bust out to try to manipulate and move us in certain directions. So here's Jesus' reply to them. All right? And I love this because Jesus actually doesn't tell the religious leaders themselves. It says he gathers those who were around him, who were there around him. All right? So he says, hey, guys, come here, come here, huddle up, huddle up. So let me tell you something. What goes into a person's mouth by accident because they didn't wash properly, that doesn't defile a person. It does not put them at odds with God. Because let me tell you why. God isn't small. God isn't petty. God isn't one of those, I got you gods, all right? If you've ever heard that, if you're ever raised with that, I need you to hear that today. God is not a gotcha God. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you and puts you at odds with God. It what comes out of your mouth. That's what defiles you. Mic drop. And Jesus just walks away. Because there's no more to say. And so he's walking away, right? And his disciples are running after him. And they're like, yo, 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 yo. Dude, do you know you just ticked off the Pharisees? And Jesus is like, eh, yeah, they'll be fine. Right? Because this had huge religious implications for people who were listening to this. For all their lives, they were always told by the Pharisees when it was convenient, hey, 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 you can't do that because the traditions of the elders say blah, 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 right? And Jesus said, you know what? 
It's not what goes inside of you that defiles, because we all know, I love the way Jesus puts it, we all know that if it goes in, it's going to come right back out, right? But it's what starts in here, inside of you, from the heart. You want to know what puts you at odds with God? Not accidentally eating the wrong thing, not accidentally violating oral tradition or the law, the thing that puts you at odds with God is when what comes out of your mouth puts you at odds with the people that God loves. God loves the you behind you, behind you, next to you, in front of you, beside you at work, in front of you in the grocery store, the beside you in the car, beside you in your neighborhood. God loves those people. So anything that does harm to those people puts you at odds with God. Because you have to be mindful about what's inside here. Because the things that come out of your mouth start here. The things that you do a lot of times start here. They originate within. Okay? And we need to be mindful about those things that begin within. All right? We need to be mindful of the things that begin within. And a lot of times what comes out is because of emotions. Now, one thing before I wrap things up here that I want to clarify. If you're already on your phone, you're already emailing me because you think that I'm bashing religious rituals, go ahead and delete it because I'm not, okay? Religious rituals can be very, very important. They can be very, very meaningful. But what I'm saying here is, is that when you look at the words of Jesus and when you look at the actions of Jesus, they are not a means by which you keep God happy or satisfied. And Jesus is saying, if you choose rituals and rules over relationship you can find yourself at odds with God. Jesus was very consistent on this, by the way. Time and time again, he had a conversation later on about the Sabbath. What are you going to do? Leave somebody dying on the side of the road because you can't work on the Sabbath? Right? He says, you got to pay attention to relationships before rules. Right? We talked about this in our last series, Right? We need to avoid the drift away from grace and towards law. We must always err on the side of grace, right? And Jesus is very clear on this point. Be mindful about what is within you because when it comes out and it is harmful to others, that is what defiles you and that is what puts you at odds with God. So over the next couple of weeks, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look at some of those emotions, how we can be mindful of them, and how we can make sure that they're not the boss of us. So here's where I want you to start. We started with saying, I'm messy and that's okay. We know, okay, we know that we're perfect where we're at and we need improvement at the same time. So I want you to pick one emotion, all right? I don't want you to get caught up. And I don't, you want, I don't want you to ignore the other weeks, all right, and focus only on the one that you pick. But here are the four that we're going to talk about, all right? I'm going to put them up on the screen. All right, we're going to talk about anger, guilt, fear, and envy, okay? We're going to talk about the harmful ones because I, first, okay? Because I think the harmful ones always cause more harm, <laughs> all right? So everybody look at these. Pick one, all right? Pick one that you know always comes to the surface and has a tendency of being the boss of you. All right? Everybody got it? Everybody got that one? All right? All right, now this may be weird and you might not want to play and that's okay. But here's what I want you to say. I want you to say, you're not the boss of me. Tell it to it right now. Go ahead. Say it out loud. I don't just tell it. There you go. 
It's not the boss of you. And as we find out over the next couple of weeks, these are not you. They don't make up our identity. Okay? And we're going to talk about that as we wrap this series up. All right? If we can learn to separate emotion from who we are as a person, we can deal with it better. But it takes mindfulness to know that. And the reason why I told you to tell it that you're not the boss of me is because you already have a boss. You have a better boss. It's a better boss than anger. It's a better boss than guilt. It's a better boss than fear. And it's a better boss than envy. And here's what your boss says to you during this time. Your better, your better boss tells you, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right? Matthew 11, 28 and 29. All right? Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle of heart. And let's all say this last line together. And you will find rest for your souls. Isn't that what we all want? So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to become mindful. We're going to learn how to deal with it. And we're going to learn to take these over and give them to the real boss of us so that we can find rest for our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand and sing our next song.
please be seated.